to the sixth chapter of Mosiah. Oh, we've just been laughing along. You can see that. The sixth chapter of Mosiah. And that's the best place to begin, the new year, because it begins the new year with them. Remember, this is the meeting, the great assembly that's held at the new year to launch not only a new age of state, but a new constitution. This is the time when the constitution is confirmed. At the beginning of the meeting, they didn't take a census. Remember, David was rebuked for taking a census. A census is part of it. But after the meeting was over, Everyone who had registered and signed the covenant, their names were taken, and they made the list of Enkizi, and it, fortunately, it was, just happened to correspond perfectly with the name of everybody that was there, because everybody signed up. That was ideal, the way it should be. But they begin a new regime, and this is, becomes the, the uh, organic constitution of the nation, is that of Mosiah. And, uh, of course, his father, <coughs> Benjamin, established it, but his grandfather, Mosiah, established it, too. And this is observed right till the end. Right till the end, they, they're bound by that, which is based entirely on the law of Moses. It comes up time and again here. And where we begin with chapter 6 of Mosiah, oh, and everybody bring Books of Mormon. Everybody without a Book of Mormon can go home right now, you see. But you must have Book of Mormon. That's the notebook. That's what we go over. That's the oracle, you see, and we've got, we got to go by that. And uh, King Benjamin has just finished his farewell address, as we say here. And so we can retrace our steps to Jerusalem. We fill in sort of here. You know what happened? Mosiah, I'm going to let people get in here, was the son of Benjamin, who was the son of Mosiah, who came to Zarahemla by command. And when he came there, the people made him king. That's the thing not without precedence. We'll see that. Where did he come from? He came from Nephi's community. Uh, what was Nephi's community? Well, as we learned in Omni, when the main body, after they'd landed, uh, there was so much tension among it that Nephi couldn't stand it. It had been right from the beginning, you know, this terrible tension in the family, this, this hatred, this jealousy. Be up and down, up and down. Typical Semitic, <coughs> typical Near Eastern, typical Palestinians they were, actually, see, because they were mixed blood. We've seen this from, from, the, uh, from the genealogy of Lehi as belonging to Manasseh and other things. And the... Uh, the tension got so great that Nephi decided to leave, just as they'd left Jerusalem, with anyone who wanted to follow him, Brother Jacob, all the rest of them, a big crowd left, and settled again, the settlement of Nephi, and there where you get the, the small books from them, and you go down the, the various descendants, and, uh, and then that went on to the time of uh, Amalekai. Amalekai, and then in Amalekai's day, Another break-off. These break-offs all the time. That is the, the Rechabite process. We've referred to that before. In the 35th chapter of Jeremiah, it tells us that uh, if you want to live righteously when the city gets bad, what do you do? You immigrate, and that's been done. You do it here. We do it everywhere. If you, you leave, uh, Utah has a big out drain right now, uh, and that is the, the Rechabites. Uh, Jonadab and Rechab, we won't go into that now. You read about that in the 35th chapter of, of Jeremiah. But they left. They're always breaking off. So, as you know, Lehi left Jerusalem. He was told to go. And then when they landed here, they had their colony. And then Nephi, when things got very bad, was commanded to leave them. And he went out, and that's when they built the temple. And then Nephi's people in the generations went bad. So you follow, follow Jacob, uh, Amor, uh, Jacob, Amor, and Omni, and the rest, and finally you get to Amalekai. And then in that time, then Mosiah, then they've got bad. <laughs> this is the process, and it's necessary to leave again. We're told Mosiah himself was commanded to leave, and he went out for a new colony and, uh, and came to, Jews, uh, to Zarahemla, where they made him king. Well, let's see now. I have here Mosiah, the son of Benjamin, was the son of Mosiah, who came to Zarahemla by command of Nehi's community, Omni 12, you see. In the time of Amlekai, the son of Abinadom, who was the son of Chemish, who was the son of Amoram, who was the son of, son of Omni, when the people had departed from keeping the covenants. Every time that happens, that's happened again and again. Now, that community was founded, well, we mentioned when Lehi led a group away. Let's trace them back then. I've been going backwards this way. Uh, from Jerusalem. Well, that was an awfully long journey to make from Jerusalem, coming all the way from Jerusalem to the west coast of South America. Quite a journey. Now a lot have been, recently, you know, a lot of studies have been made of, of, of South Sea uh, navigation and so forth, showing their uncanny skill at traveling many thousands of miles across the open sea, 
with the secrets of navigation they have uh, of currents of air masses of stars and all the rest of it but it just happened at that time 600 bc was the great time in the world that was the great time of colonization and exploration if you wanted a colony you had to explore well why would that be a great time of colonization because things were very bad in the old cities corruption everywhere and see it always only takes a few bad years of weather to start things moving in and back in Jerusalem as we know you read Jerusalem Lehi was in trouble Jeremiah was in trouble because they objected to the corruption of the people in the city and above all in their greed and at the same time in Athens a contemporary of Lehi who was Solomon of Athens Solomon. he was writing on the very same subject so in the very same conditions he migrated too he didn't take people with him he gave them a constitution then he left and wandered for seven years I would say he's a good, he could have been a very good friend of, of Lehi not only thought alike but they did business in the same area at Sidon and uh, they were both importers exporters and so forth and merchants we're beginning with the sixth chapter those that all came in in the sixth chapter of Mosiah where the great, the great uh, assembly is. It's the farewell address of King Benjamin and the inauguration of his son, whom he crowns, he's going to see here, and they carry on with a new order, which doesn't last very long because Mosiah is succeeded by the judges. But right now, M uh, Mosiah is the great one. His father was Benjamin, his father was Mosiah, who came and settled in Zarahem. And this takes place in Zarahem, which is not a Nephite city. It's not Nephites and Lamanites at all. They're Mulekites, a much greater population than either one. Where did they came from? They also came from Jerusalem just 11 years after Lehi came from Jerusalem. Well, and then we said, what are these people doing running around like this? Well, in the year 600 is called the pivotal year. That's a term that uh, Carl Jaspers, a German philosopher, has given it, but, but many people talk about it too also. H.G. Wells calls it that too. It's the uh, Jaspers. It's the, well, better write pivotal instead. The pivotal period because the whole world turned on a pivot and you get a new age, a perfect time for the Book of Mormon to begin. A new culture, history, a new setting, a new world. All the old sacral kinships collapsed all at once. Well, what would do that? Well, of course, the weather, migration. You read the Greek lyric poets from the seventh century just before this, like Mimnerus and Kalinus and so forth. They tell about the invasion of the Sumerians, bathed up and up, no. I enter Gignai, oh yes. Bathed out on. I'll think of it. Well, anyway, he wrote a poem about how the Sumerians came and swept into Asia Minor, uh, wiped everything out, settled down there. Some of the north who became Goths, our ancestors, way back in that early time, in Lehi's time, they were invading and pushing in. Why? Because the steppes had dried out and they were forced to move. And the most important place in the world at that point, of course, was Palestine, as it always has been. That's where people have always been coughed out. One, one wave after another has been spewed out of Palestine because of the political tensions, and the political tensions are caused by revolutions and so forth, which are caused by migrations, which are caused by weather changes. That's, that's geopolitics. We don't go into that, except that Palestine is very important, you see there. And the book, it's very important in the Book of Mormon here, because you, in the Jaredites, you have the other condition. The Jaredites went north into the Valley of Nimrod, which is marked actually going up by the Caspian Sea and so forth. They took the land route across Central Asia. Lehi took the, the water route. Now, the the essence of geopolitic, they're wasting a lot of film. I think I mentioned some of this last, last uh, <laughs> semester. You can shut off the machine, it'll save you a good deal. There. Uh, let me see. Is the uh, house Homer, but uh, the originator of it is Halford Mackinder, a Scotch geographer in the 19th century, Mackinder. And it was called, this is what set Hitler going, you see. That's why he had to take Russia, the, the uh, Ukrainian breadbasket and so forth. And that was Haushofer, and it was called geopolitics. And it's very simple. The thing is that the hit world history has always been rivalry between the great land power and the great sea power. And the great land power is Asiatic. At this time, as he was, it was the Austro-Prussian agreement, the, uh, just like the Axis. The command, the, the, what, what he calls the heartland. The heartland is that area of Asia and Europe which is covered by snow in the wintertime. It's, it takes the form of a shield. And from there, and that's nomadic, and these people live on, not all nomadic, of course, but it is marginal. In a bad year, they have to move, and they move in all directions. And, and for this reason, uh, people have to defend themselves. That's, for that reason, you have the Great Wall of China, you have the, the Khyber, uh, here you have the, the, the wall of the Asiatics, the Amu. 
uh, the Great White Wall of the Egyptians and so forth, and clear across Europe, you have the Limes built by the Romans, uh, way up to Hadrian's Wall up in Scotland. They built physical walls to keep these people out. Those walls lasted for hundreds of years, and the pressure was on them all the time. Well, the most important part in the world, the most important place in the world is the cockpit where they all fight. It's the only place where and these they're talking about World War II, where the, the land power was Brit the sea power was Britain, of course, all the sea and the land power was the central the central powers. And according to Haushofer and to uh, and to uh, Mackinder, the sea power always wins. It can shut off the other ones from markets and everything else. But uh, it, it has the last World War was the very same sort of thing: sea power versus land power. And Hitler, uh, the Germans always tried to get a, the, the thing that brought on World War II was. Kaiser building up a huge fleet because he had to be the sea power. But where does the sea invade the land? This great land mass of Asia, Africa, and Europe here, and there's only one place where the sea goes in thousands of miles, and that's the Mediterranean. And at the end here, the three places come together, Asia, Africa, Europe, and this is Palestine, and they were always fighting for it, and they were fighting for it in Lehi, see, because, because uh, Babylon was the great power under Nebuchadnezzar, and they had already taken Jerusalem a few years before, but they didn't destroy it completely. King Mosiah, uh, King Josiah, who reformed the, and I think Mosiah was named with him in view, who uh, reformed the constitution and saved and saved uh, and saved, uh, and saved Israel from the uh, from the Babylonians, who was killed by King Necho in, in a battle up here, and. Uh, and then Necho t the, the fight is between King Necho, and this is what Necho did. He's, he is the king who rules that uh, Necho II in the 26th dynasty. He ruled in the time of Lehi, see? And he saw this business. He, he saw that he could not prevail against, against, uh, against Babylon as a land power. But he was an Egyptian that had a great navy, and then, he did, then in Lehi's day, the trireme was invented, it was discovered by the Corinthians. They started turning out these, these marvelous warships that nothing could resist them. And Necho bought them all up. He had a navy of Greeks, and he occupied Palestine with, with, with Greek soldiers. The Greeks, you found Greeks everywhere. We find from here, this time we have inscriptions way up the Nile of the Bidus, at Abydos, and, and up at the, at the Aswan, uh, soldiers writing their names, Greek soldiers writing their names up there in the high state. And you find Greek names in the Book of Mormon. They, they pop up occasionally, you know, especially later on. So we have Necho, oh, said it this way, and what did he do, remember? It was in his day that he sent a fleet clear around Africa, all the way around Africa. Nothing like that's ever been done. To reach that, the same time he built, I should have done a map here, the same time he built the canal, the Suez Canal. He started, he didn't finish it, but it was finished and it worked. So this was the time of great expansion. And in these Greek lyric poets, and one of them, for example, one of them, his brother, uh, was a, a mercenary in the... Uh, was a mercenary in the uh, Egyptian king in Necho's army, and he was a mercenary in the Babylonian army. They you just go out and hire themselves and so forth. So it's a time when everybody's moving around everywhere, and the pressure is on, and the one thing is to get good land. So they were exploring. They take these long explorers. They went up to Britain. They went all over the place. They went up above the Black Sea. At this time, they, they settled a lot of colonies in Russia, way up in the... Uh, uh, in, in the... Uh, I was going to say, uh, in the north end of the Black Sea, in the, uh, in the Euxin, and uh, up in, into Russia. The, oh my gosh, what do they call that area? But anyway, you see, this is a, this is a great time. And they're going out of this. It's not surprising at all that these people, once you hit the sea, and they, they stopped to, to get water and so forth, islands on the way, and supplies. And they may have left their names at places. Uh, the name Moroni is found all across the southern, but Moroni's name only comes up later. Well, anyway, this was the time, and uh, so we get them now. So let's go frontward. Things were bad in the ancient world, and the, the sacral kingship fell everywhere. The Republic, see, Solon established uh, the Greek democracy. He was the inventor of democracy. He gave them a constitution with a proviso they couldn't, they couldn't change it without his signature. And when they agreed to that, then he left town for 10 years, so they'd have to live with it, and that's the basis of of Athenian democracy, from which all democracies come. Other, other cities followed the example. It's always been a struggle. It didn't last very long in Athens, as you know. Pretty soon Alexander came up. But then you get Alexander and the voyages he took. 
the people say Nearchus, his, his admiral uh, sailed all over the Pacific, some people say, and so forth, reached America and the like. It was Nearchus, it was Alexander's uh, admiral that did that. So don't be surprised at the things that are happening. Now, this is an explosive age at this time. And you notice it's the time when people are trying to decide between kings and, uh, and popular governments, and it's the age of, of the tyrants. You know. These men, very able men, who rose up and put themselves in charge. This happens in the Book of Mormon, too. And so you get, uh, in Samus, uh, you get Polycrates of Samus, and you get um, Dionysus of Sicily and his son, and you get uh, Cleisthenes at Athens, and before Cleisthenes you have Pisistratus. They're just big families, important men that took over the government and, and uh, caused things to settle down. Uh, they were competent men and so forth. They didn't have any legal right to rule it was either by, by line descent or by popular. They weren't voted in popularly. A tyrant was somebody who surrounded himself with troops, usually foreign troops, usually Egyptian troops if they were in Greece and Greek troops if they were in Egypt, and set themselves up and ruled. And this was the rule everywhere because the kingship had broken down everywhere. And every, in 600 BC, everybody was asking, who's in charge around here? Anybody who can grab the power, that wasn't good enough. So it leads to some terrible things, and this is the settling down after the, after the Great Migrations. There were Great Migrations earlier, the same thing happened earlier. And then the settling down and the rivalry between the great houses and the great families. That's the story of Greek tragedy, which is archaic, goes back to the myths and so forth, when the same thing was happening. But the Book of Mormon is entirely in the, in the milieu here. Now let's see what uh, the man's written down here. And uh, so, but the theme of the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants is the anatomy of destruction. Remember, it starts out, oh, that great city of Jerusalem was about to be destroyed. And the Book of Mormon ends on complete destruction. With all destructions all in the end, and it's all as a warning to us. The opening words of the Doctrine and Covenants are the same way. Remember, hearken, O ye people, my church, and give it, and then that there is no heart that shall not be penetrated. For the time is not now, but is near at hand, when peace shall be taken away from the earth, and the devil have control of his own dominion. We're moving towards some, some great destruction. So these books are given as warnings on the eve of great destruction. But this had happened all through the Bible. As you know, that's what the prophets do. They warn the destruction of Jerusalem, which is destroyed from time to time. It, say it had been destroyed earlier. Uh, it had been destroyed by the Assyrians in 720. And uh, then again, it's been destroyed by Nephi, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar earlier. And they agreed to keep, and Josiah broke his, uh, his agreement with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, that brought Nebuchadnezzar back, and, uh, and Josiah was killed in the, in the Battle of Megiddo. Well, so, it was a very long journey. And, now, Zarahemla was not a Nephite city. We get the, the Book of Mormon, the, uh, the racial, the ethnic picture in the Book of Mormon is very complicated. You got the simplistic idea that anytime you see somebody uh, or find any ruin or anything in this country, it must be either a uh, Nephite or a Lamanite. Well, that's absolutely silly. You've got a, a very complex picture, as we've seen before, and it's going to get complexer as we go along. Now, the La uh, it was a Mulekite city. And you know who the Mulekites were? It means the king's people. We're told in the Bible that there was only one survivor from, from uh, Z Zedekiah's family. And uh, he got away. You see, they went up to, uh, not Rav, Rabban, where uh, the family was put to death. All his sons were put to death before the eyes of the king, and he was blinded then, and then he was taken to Babylon. That was the king who was ruling in the time of, of uh, Lehi. And we have for that a contemporary record now. We have the Lachish or Lachish records that describe, written of the city, the last great fortress that was taken, and it describes the fall and destruction at the time of Lehi. The original documents, they're not copies of copies, they're not something that's come down in Herodotus or something that's been passed down through the Middle Ages. We have the original documents from the time the city fell, giving us exactly the same picture we get in the Book of Mormon, the, terror, the factions, of the broken families, the rivalries, the one side favors Egypt, the other side Babylon, and uh, as with the prophets and so forth. And it's a terrible picture. But the family sets out, and uh, 11 years after them, you see, there was a, uh, another group came, a large group. They gathered. They were the ones that saw the city was going to fall, and they took off. 
Well, how did they ever make it? It was I think people were doing it all the time. It was no great thing at this time. They could they could do it. It was a great thing, but it, but it could be done. And uh, they called themselves the Mulekites, the Mulekia. That means the, the king people, because they were told in the Book of Mormon, the youngest son of the king went with them. Their pride and joy was they were the king's people. And Mulek is not the word Malik is king, but the word Mulek means little king, uh, little, little dear little king. It's a it's a correlative. And it's a diminutive. The Mulekites were the people that had the little king with them. They were rather proud of that. And uh, they came over. And he was uh, a child of about 10 or 11 at that time. He may have been older. And we saw some stories about him connected with the Lakish letters. It's, it's all quite plausible as far as that goes. They're getting over here. But they were a bigger group. And uh, Zarahemla is the big city. Zarahemla is one of the names. You see, Darahemla. It's a very good uh, oriental name, of course. It means red city. Uh, and... Uh, you find it in other places there's a very important trading center right in the center of the of the uh, Sahara called Zarahemla. Yes? Now, the Phoenicians You're Brother Roper, aren't you? I can remember you now. The, the Phoenicians were ship people. Is it possible that the Mulekites had some connection well, with them? Well, now remember, this is if, if, uh, if Nephi wanted to do business, from he would do it either through Sidon or he could do it through Tyre. But Sidon was the main port at that time. It's a very interesting thing that at that very time, uh, the Phoenicians at that time controlled Sire, Sidon. They didn't always, but at that time they controlled Sidon. See, uh, the, the other people you had there, along with the Phoenicians, you had the Philistines at the same time. They were the coast people too. These were Phoenicians, and of course they spoke a language just like, uh, just like Hebrew. But they, uh, the Sidon, they were the great ship people too, of course, and the, the alphabet and all the rest we attribute to the Phoenicians because they got around so. They got around all over the place, and, and Phoenician ships. You know, uh, somebody like uh, uh, Cyrus Gordon. These Phoenicians came here, and you can find Phoenician inscriptions in Brazil and so forth. In fact, I went down to see a Phoenician inscription, a big Phoenician inscription, supposed to be, I think it was faked, uh, on a rock at uh, Los, Los, uh, Las Lunas in New Mexico, where the uh, turquoise mines were, the ancient turquoise mines. There was an inscription there, it was perfectly good Phoenician, but I thought somebody may have faked it as far as that goes. Maybe it wasn't, you know. Except it was a bad mistake. Somebody had gone over the letters recently with a sharp tool and they were all fresh cut new. If they'd left them alone, you see, so they could use the lighting and so forth, then you'd see, but that could be decided. So the Phoenicians got around too, and of course they say they're believed that they, they got reached the, uh, uh, and there's Gary, Gary Phil, the, the, the Harvard, Ma uh, the, the Harvard marine biologist who had the, uh, the all sorts of crackpot theories about the Libyans coming over here and so forth. But then uh, actually the, the uh, Contiki and the Ray, those, especially the Ray, their, their purpose was to hire dolls for voyages were to show that it could be made in either direction, either Pacific or the Atlantic. He crossed it in, in a reed boat, imagine, in a boat made of nothing but rushes from Egypt. Well, we're told the uh, ship was a more solid structure than that, but these things are all right. Well, we're going to get now here some some other things to notice here. Oh, we got plenty of time. That's good. Uh, the uh, oh, Mosiah was made king, but he he came in with his group. Remember, he was told to leave this group of uh, people, the Nephite settlement that had been settled by Nephi after this rule of well, Chemish means five of about six kings. Then he was told to go because the people had gone bad again. He comes out and he lands up in. Zarahemla, and they want him to be king. Is that a no That's a very normal procedure. I talk about tyrants. Sometimes they were very popular, sometimes they were chosen. Their great desire was to get themselves made king. And this happened in numbers of occasions. But we have that in our own time, of course. Think of the kings, that have, uh, foreign kings that have come in and been chosen by people uh, after uh, Charles II. The, uh, it, well, it looks as they were going to be a Catholic succession in England. The, uh, the English chose the King of Scotland, James IV, to come in and be James I. He was a Scotch, he wasn't English at all. And he came in, became King of England, and then uh, when it appeared again, uh, another showdown, they brought in William and Mary from the Netherlands. And when they they became kings of England. And then, uh, most trouble happened, and then we have, uh, they bring in George I. We didn't even speak English. Even Queen Victoria spoke with a German accent. And uh, they, they brought in George I, II, III, IV in a row. And uh, they were Germans. They were the Hanoverian kings. What were they doing in England when the people elected them? They called them in because they represented, there was tension among them, and they represented 
the, uh, the dominant party and the dominant interest. This sort of thing happens all, all, all the time. We think of the Romanovs, the, uh, the Tsars, as uh, the ancient rulers of Rome, nothing of the sort. That was just in the 18th century. Romanov was a, was a pirate or something that just took over the throne, was accepted the Romanovs. And the same thing with the last Shah. His father, Reza Shah, was a giant of a man, a man in the army. He was a good family, one of the nobility and so forth. But there has not been a single case in the long history of Persia where a legitimate, jar had, uh, a legitimate Shah has, has succeeded his father. They were always bumped off and it was always somebody else. It happened, as we mentioned, in 67 cases. But the, uh, so as I say, Reza Shah, this, uh, this last Shah, that one was thrown out, that was put in by the CIA. The, uh, no, he was, that's no joke. That's not take a secret or anything like that. Uh, he pretended, he put on all the glory of ancient Persia, a 2,000 year old empire and kingship, and it was that. But he wasn't of that long line of kings at all. He, he was Reza Shah, who was a big bully. Uh, son. So we, and we have two kinds of criticism in the Book of Mormon, you notice. When you criticize any ancient record, there are two ways of criticizing it. You can use macro-criticism or micro-criticism. That's something new. I just discovered it. Just thought of it. Uh, and you can see what macro-criticism is. When you read the Book of Mormon, you say, is this really true and so forth? Now we're talking about evidence here, and this is not the most important thing, of course. Uh, the evidence confirms the teachings. The teachings wouldn't need any evidence at all to hit you in the solar plexus. They're, they're true. We'll find that out soon enough. But that is, when you read this, is this the way things really were? Was it that kind of a world? Uh, is that the way the world was at that time? Were the people agriculture, agriculture nomadic or urban? Or uh, what was the setting? Is it jungle? You see, it would come, it sticks out all over here. Is it a jungle setting or, uh, and the geography? They move a great distance, but how great? I, I would never waste five minutes on Book of Mormon geography. Never bother about it. But it was there until you get some definite points of reference. Well, you have Zarahemra, that's the point. We don't know where Zarahemra was, as far as that goes. So don't worry about that, it's all relative anyway. But the macro criticism, there are great things to go by there. There are some big things. Uh, and there are the, uh, the micro criticism, which is very close to it, for. These are hundreds of details that get smaller and smaller. As we read more and more, we notice all sorts of little things. And it's their triviality that makes them so important. They're trivial clues, you see, because they're the things that no one ever would have bothered to think of or dream up or look up that know that this was the way things were done at that time. And the Book of Mormon, these hints are sewed around with a lavish hand. Things that only an observer could know. Like the tokens of recognition, you see, in, a, uh, in one of the, in the new comedy, which became the, in, in the Christians, became the recognition literature. When a family is separated, remember, like, like Comedy of Errors, or like the uh, Twelfth Night, uh, where they're separated, and how do they recognize each other? By a token, by a ring, or something that the baby was buried with. Uh, or uh, a dress, something like that is the token, or the chest in which the baby was found, or there are certain signs and tokens by which people recognize each other. Well, that's the way it is with the Book of Mormon. All, every once in a while, not every once in a while, but very often, we bump on these hints that could only uh, come from, from a member of the family, you might say, tokens of recognition, the recognition drama. Now, you notice the last verse of the preceding chapter, chapter 15. Notice it says here, Abounding in good works, it ends on a very upbeat affair. Now, this is an interesting thing about this meeting. This was a great, at the end of the very brilliant reign of Benjamin, who's made them victorious over their enemies and assured prosperity in the land. Things were going wonderfully. They're at the peak of their power and glory and influence. Must have been a splendid affair. And all Benjamin does during his whole speech is to throw cold water on their pride and so forth. Don't get any ideas, he said, that you're anybody at all. He really cuts them down to size again and again. I would that you should always bear in mind, uh, in remembrance, your own nothingness, he says, and the greatness of God in your own nothingness. If you do this, you will always rejoice, he said. Because remember, you are less than the dust. You are, we're nothing. We have no right to claim anything at all. And he goes on and on. That's the whole theme. Then he gets to the end of his speech, and it's upbeat, and he says, Always abounding in good works, that Christ the Lord God of the Omnipotent may seal you his, and may be brought to heaven, that ye may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through, notice, the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things. This takes us right back to Lehi's day, and to Solomon, and to Plato. These are the four Platonic virtues. You see, that's what they are. And that's there, you notice. What are the Platonic virtues? Wisdom, justice, 
valor, moderation, you see. And here it is, wisdom and uh, wisdom and power, uh, valor. See, God, God uh, doesn't need valor or courage. If you're all powerful, you know, you're not afraid of anything. But it's his power. It's not men's power. It's all his power. It's his power. But that's the equivalent in the Platonic virtues that men should possess as wisdom and not power but valor, you see, courage to carry on because our power is weak. But then justice and mercy, they're, they're the two great ones, remember. Incidentally, from time to time, a shaggy dog will pass among you know better than that. You'll be afflicted by a few lines of Shakespeare, but you must allow that. You have to suffer that patiently. You, we know the speech on justice and mercy, don't we? The quality of mercy is not strained. Justice and mercy. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven can't resist it, you see, upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It's the king, you see. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the uh, temporal things, the power of temporal things, the attributes of awe and majesty wherein reside the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above his something sway, yes. It is implanted in the hearts of kings. I'll think of that in a second. It is an attribute to God himself. Here it is, you see, justice and mercy in God. It is an attribute in God himself. And earthly power does then show likest gods when justice tempers mercy. The justice and the mercy and the power. And so Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us would see salvation. We do plead for mercy, and that same prayer does teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. The justice and mercy. Now, this is the old classic line. Shakespeare's picking that up, actually. It goes way back. And uh, remember, uh, Plato is always talking about it. He's a called the four platonic virtues because he discusses them so in balance with each other and so forth. And in, uh, actually, uh, Benjamin has given them an extremely well-balanced and beautifully composed address. It's a marvelous address which teaches, above all things, humility for men. So then we go on. Now King Benjamin thought it was expedient after doing that he should take the names of the people. See, he didn't have a census at first. Remember, David offended the Lord by doing that. But a very important part of this meeting, remember, this takes place at the New Year, we're told, because they all brought their first fruits. And it's the establishment of the new government because the king is taking over. The, the date was set by the old king. He says, I'll, I'll make you king on this particular date. You sent out the, send out the announcements. Very interesting. He has his son make the announcement. And why should that be? Because according to normal order, the, the meeting wouldn't be held until the old king was dead, you see. The, the, the king, the, the son always uh, announced the meeting and brought the people together because his father wasn't there anymore. If he'd done that before, he'd be guilty of treason. He'd be guilty of plotting against his father prematurely to put him off the throne or something. So they always waited until the old king was out of the way and then his son would summon the people. So Benjamin instructs his son that he's to bring the people together, take charge of the meeting and so forth. And we've seen what kind of a meeting it was, including the speech from the tower and all the rest of us. That's the old Jewish practice, which is not found in the Bible, but is found in some other sources we saw last semester. So he had to take the names of all those who'd entered the covenant, you see. He didn't force them to sign and, he, and take the names and uh, see what about their free rights and so forth. But those who signed the covenant, of course, were willing now. They'd already put their names on the covenant, so their names are taken and they're put on the list, which is the Book of Life, which is opened at the New Year, which is a register of all the people who are going to have a right to live in the kingdom and pay taxes during that year. That's what the Book of Life is. Remember, we're called in the Bible the Book of Life that is open at the beginning of the world, the creation of the world. You find that it's a Babylonian, it's an Egyptian custom, it's Greek and everywhere else. And in Rome, it's especially interesting. It's the book, the Enchisi. At the New Year, as you know, you tell fortunes and you, uh, and you use divination to discover what the fortunes of the New Year are going to be. Everyone is assigned an appointment. <laughs> it's the only time you can make contracts in most ancient societies. For example, in England, if you want to fire, hire a servant, you must do it at the Great Assembly, where uh, the Great Assembly, going way back, now they've discovered within the last two or three years that those old stone circles and so forth, like Stonehenge and Everbury, uh, are dated differently today. And they, uh, they've put them back 2,000 years or farther now. <coughs> they go way back. And it's very interesting that Silbury Hill, which has the same dimensions exactly as the, as the, it's up there by Avery, as the Great Pyramid, is now given the date 2750 BC, which is exactly the date of the Great Pyramid. It's just like it and everything else. 
built there. It's a marvelous structure, the highest artificial mound in Europe. It's up there in England by Marlborough. So they put them on the list of the Inchisi, the incised list. In Rome, it was a, they had big uh, wooden pillars and swinging from them as we have, say it, in stations and places and uh, exhibitions where you have these swinging leaves with, uh, with advertising on them and so forth. They had these lead plates that would swing around. They had lead because they were easy to inscribe. They inscribed the names of every citizen, and every citizen had to come. If he didn't come, and everyone, and we're told that at the end of the book of Zechariah, next to the last book of the Bible, and upon anyone who does not come up to Jerusalem at the new year to hail the new king, upon them shall be no rain, and they'll receive no blessings. You have to come. And in Rome, they'd come clear from Sicily and clear from Gaul, so they could be present at the meeting. We're told of one, way back in Republican times, we're told of the, uh, before the emperors, of one uh, venerable gent who was coming up from, from Calabria w with his daughter there to, to come to the meeting. And on the mountain pass down there, they were struck by lightning. So we know that, we know that they were making a struggle to get to the meeting. And, uh, and there wasn't one soul. So everyone that had signed had agreed to the covenant. You see what the covenant was if you read the other one, was to keep the covenant. You were this day reborn. He's going to remember. He gave them a new name. There, it was their birthday. It was the beginning of the society of a new age. Everything began anew on that day. Everything was renewed. He says, "Remember, he gave them a new name, and uh, then he has them all registered. He, he takes their names down, and so they're all commanded, all set for the new age now. It's going to go on, and it says uh, there was not one soul, except it were little children, but who had entered into the covenant and had the name taken, uh, the name of Christ." And then, that being the code, all the people are registered, so now they can vote. Notice, he does this before he anoints or crowns his son, because these people have to be registered voters in order to give the acclamatio. That's the acclamation of the king. If you don't raise your voice in acclamation of the king, then you're considered an outlaw and you're banished from the kingdom for three years. This is the rule that you find almost everywhere. So that's what we have here. There wasn't one soul, like little children, except who had entered into the covenant and had their names taken, and then they could approve the king, because they were now full-fledged citizens. It came to pass that when King Benjamin had made an end of all these things, he con then he consecrated his son, Mosiah. And it's a sacral government to be a ruler and a king over his people, that's kingship. And gave him all the charges concerning the kingdom. Now he can take it over. And he had appointed a priest to teach the people. You notice it is a, as in the law of Moses, the Israel, I had kings of Israel and, and Judah. And, but the, the uh, priest taught the people in the temple and in the synagogue. The king was a teacher, too. He was the prime teacher. But uh, in the temple and the synagogue, the priests had their teachings to perform. And uh, it was Solomon Sightland who showed that synagogues did not first develop after the fall of the temple to take its place, just plain meeting houses. They had them all along, right from the first. So uh, and this is the reason that they're supposed to teach them, to stir them up in remembrance of the oath which they had made. So they'd taken a covenant and an oath, covenant and an oath which they'd made. And he's to stir them up here. You notice this is the eniatos. Uh, they don't repeat the ceremony. You only receive an endowment. You only take the oath once, but you remember it after. That's why in the sacrament that they always remember him, that they may keep his commandments he has given. They always have his, uh, his spirit to be with them. And they renew the covenants, but not by going through them again, by, by, but by a different ordinance. It renews the covenants we made of remembrance. This do in remembrance of me, as he said in the sacrament, to remember. Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, that they might hear and know the commandments of God and stir them up in remembrance of their oath, to renew the terms from time to time. Every year, the oath was renewed. That's why the people had to come and renew it. They didn't say you only take it once, because you take it for life. You take it forever. You're never going to break it. That's the idea. But we weaken, and sometimes we have to renew them. Uh, and it's as a witness. We say as, as a witness. When we, when we take the sacrament, it is as a witness that we remember. That's what it's for. You, you make the covenant once. It's interesting, that difference. Whereas the Mass, Catholic Mass, claims to be the actual repetition of the event. It actually is the sacrifice. It's, a, it's in a mystic way, of course, but it's the event. With us, it's just recalling to memory, as far as that goes. And then he dismissed the multitude, and they returned everyone according to their families. Another very interesting touch. The great assembly under in the Mosaic lawn throughout the ancient world is by families. When they come, everybody has to come as a pilgrim and be dismissed to his home after that. Thou shalt not celebrate the Passover within thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Everyone must come to this event as a pilgrim. 
And they sit by family groups, and they sit in circles. Every family with its back to every other. Every family by itself. We're told this, and, and not in only the New Testament, the Tal Old Testament, and the Talmud too, with their backs to the other groups. And everyone, the last meeting, they when they take the meal, everyone must eat a piece of the meat as big as an olive, at least as big as an olive, and they must eat it with their staff in their hand, their shoes on their feet, and their cloaks ready to go. And then they must leave when they're finished and not look back when you leave, because here's the sacred place. It's Maktus. This is the holy place where we meet, where we meet commonly with the ancestors, gods, and everything else. They all See, I'm talking about an order of beginning the, the, he the heliocentric rites, of which I've written a good deal of that, published a lot of stuff on this. And uh, what you do is a place is Maktus. It's the place open to the other world. You notice in the, with the Hopis, the, uh, it's a sand patch in the beginning, and there, there's where you sit around here. And there's the altar, and there's the two little trees on either side with their Christmas tree decorations on them. See, this is very ancient. But that's the sand place. The Greeks call it the conistra. It means the sand patch where nothing could grow and where no, pe no mortal could stand. This was just when the chorus acting as spirits as Kachinas. They would dance in there, you see. And then, of course, right at the center of everything is the Sipapu. That's the hole that goes down to the underworld, which in Rome is called the Mundus, which means the, the universe or the world. And it had a, st uh, a, a stone on the top of it called the Lapis Manalis. They had it everywhere. This was the stone uh, called the Omphalus, or the umbilical stone, at, at Delphi. And it stood over this hole to the underworld. See, it was the, and Lapis Manalis means the, the stone for keeping people in place, for keeping the spirits in their place. And when, during the festival, the stone was taken off, and it was, is, is the, uh, the Lapis was removed, and mundus patet was the formula. The mundus, or the mouth. I see our word mouth is cognate with mundus, and all the word mond, mond uh, the word for world, universe, is mond, mouth, mund, the same, same word, interestingly enough. And they, when they moved the stone, then it was mundus patet. The mount mundus is now open, the spirits come forth, the place is sacred, and everyone there is now mactus. You're exposed to, to great powers. Uh, well, the best thing is in, in Egypt, recently written by Philip Duchesne on this very subject, what happens then? He says, the meeting place, the temple, is a powerhouse where it's full of spirit and electricity. You can, you know, tremendous surges of power that went through the place. It's a, it's a very awesome thing that we come together at these meetings. But then when it was closed, then the Mundus closed it, and the, mun, uh, the, mount, uh, the Mundus is closed, and everybody goes home. But you mustn't go back there except at the proper time and place, or you'll be taken away and never be seen again. Well, these things all run together, and they're uh, great. Uh, but this is quite a detailed uh, description of the meeting that uh, that we've been given in the book of Mosiah here. But they go home, but they met according to their families. That's the important thing, by families, as I say, with their staff in their hand, the shoes in their feet, and uh, wearing their cloaks. And, uh, and they shall not look backward when they leave, because they're leaving now until another year, then they come again. And that's, now we're now, in the fourth verse, we're now safely launched. See, Mosiah began to reign in his father's stead. Now this begins at on the hour and ends at 10 to the hour. It's taken me a year to get this through my thick head. I never get, never get it right. That's what I like the man who said, what, starboard? <laughs> uh, starboard and port, you know, the captain all these years had it. It's <laughs> the same thing with me. Is it's, we start at 10, we, uh, we start on the hour, we end at 10, too. We start at the hour, we end at 10, and then I forget it. Well, anyway, well, this is a short chapter, so it goes. Benjamin lived three years and he died. Later on, we're going to find what he did. He kept the books because he was a great stickler. He was a great antiquarian. We learned that from the early part. Remember, he made his, he made his sons learn Egyptian, much little as they liked it. It was a painful job. And then King Mosiah did walk in the ways of the Lord and observe. Now, here's a good old Dead Sea Scrolls formula. The judgment, the mishpat, the judgments and the statutes and the commandments. That's those, the big three. They always go together here. But in the one... In the Sarek scroll, for example, the one is never mentioned without the other. It's always the judgments and the statutes and the commandments. The king, he is the judge, after all. Remember, King Solomon is the judge. And the statutes are the laws that are laid down, and the commandments are those which have come from God. The commandments the statutes are those that are written down by men, discussed in the council, and decided on. So we have the judgments, the statutes, and the commandments. And King Mosiah caused his people... Now, this is a tremendous clue. We talked about... We talked about uh, minor, uh, of micro, micro criticism and macro criticism. A good example of micro criticism would be wisdom and power and justice and mercy. Just a coincidence, how would he know those four platonic virtues, which in the time of Lehi were, were of such great importance? 
And here we come to this one, and this is a macro. This gives us a big picture of a way of life. These people are already living the standard way of the Indians. If you get that big volume of uh, Driver and Massey, they've collected all the evidence available, they have a huge work on the Indians at the time of Columbus, everything that was known about them. By far, more than half of the, of the United States, the whole eastern half, half, but it was bigger than the western half, was under cultivation. They were people, they were farmers. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't nomads at all. Uh, they, were, they were hunting and so forth, just as, as the jungle life in, in, in Central America, in the Milpas down in, uh, in the Maya country, down in Chiapas. They, uh, they lived in the jungle and yet they farmed. They, it's a, farming, a method of farming. But they all farmed here. This is the point. He also did till the earth that thereby he not become a burden on his people. Well, he was an egalitarian, that he might do, and he doesn't do this just for show, that he may do that which his father had done, so it was their custom. There was a completely agrarian society. Well, the Indians I know best, because I visited them often, I used to go down a great deal with them, are the Hopis, and they're 100% agrarian. A very, it's an advanced civilization, they're very intelligent, their histories, their legends, their arts, and so forth, and yet their whole life is living on nothing but corn, that's all they have to live on. Uh, it's a, it's, and they trade it, and they trade it with the Akamas for peppers and things like that. And they grow a few of them. They grow melons uh, where there's a sand, uh, where there's a heap of sand in a, in a gully. Uh, you'll see a couple of little stunted peach trees growing, anything that will grow, because it's very desolate there. But it's agriculture completely. You can't have a society that lives on nothing else and yet flourish and be a great society. We'll maybe talk about that the next time as his father had done in all things, and there was no contention among all his people for the space of three years. And that's very interesting, that no contention, because remember, the Hopis call themselves the Mokis, the peaceful people, the people that don't contend. Anyone that has contention is Kahopi, and that's very bad, and they, they have lived for centuries that way uh, without contention. They, that's why they're called, the Hopi means the peaceful people. And they do nothing, they live on agriculture, and that's their spinning, they have enough. They say, if one of us have corn, we all has corn, we all have corn. And there's no tension, they know what the situation is. The situation is completely, completely within their grasp, because you, they know where every, every grain of corn is going to come from. So simple. Well, I see the time's up now, so we've got to break it up. But uh, we're now to the seventh chapter of Mosiah. See, we're just rushing along here. And, uh, and we have, they're already, isn't that a amazing here? They're already living in the manner of Indians. It's the Indian culture already established right here. Well, of course, they've been here a long time now. Remember, they've been here 500 years. They should be catching on now. Well established.